Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2i, where we're talking about somatic mutations. Um, in the last lecture, we made the distinction between germline mutations in the cells that become our gametes and are passed on to the next generation, and somatic mutations in all the other cells of our body, which are not passed on, but die when we die. And here we'll be thinking about how mutations in these somatic cells affect us. We'll think about the mutation rates. We'll think about how the interests of the cells and the interests of the organism can be distinguished, and how mutations that benefit the cell may harm the organism, and mutations that harm the cell may not harm the organism at all. Now, Here's our diagram, the same sort of diagram we had in the last lecture, of uh, the cells dividing as a zygote develops into a large clump of cells in the embryo. What's different this time is that I've colored the cells different shades of blue to indicate that as the DNA is replicated in each cell division, mutations arise in all the descendant cells, so that even though these cells are all descended very recently from a single progenitor cell, they're already genetically different. Now, what I want us to think about is to think about the fate of a particular cell, ignoring the genetic diversity of all the other cells around it. Um, but before we do that, let's think about the different kinds of consequences that a mutation can have for a particular cell. So in any specific tissue, including in the embryo, some mutations are going to be harmful to the cell. They're going to reduce its ability to grow or its ability to stay alive. Um, other mutations, probably the bulk of mutations, as we described in earlier lectures in this module, most mutations are in parts of the genome that don't make any functional contribution to the cell. So that most mutations are going to be neutral. They're not going to alter the cell's growth or its viability. It'll be just like all the other cells phenotypically. Finally, some mutations may be beneficial to the cell. They'll increase the cell's ability to grow, to exploit the resources that are around it, or allow it to stay alive under conditions when cells around it are dying. So first we're going to consider the effect of these mutations on the cell and its descendants and then we're going to consider how these effects translate into effects on the organism. So back to our drawing of a cell in a mass of cells in an embryo. First, if a mutation is harmful to the cell, then the cell is going to be lost from the population of developing cells. It may die, it may just fail to grow when other cells are growing around it. If this mutation is neutral to the cell, then the cell is just going to behave like all the other cells. If the other cells are growing, as they would in an embryo, the cell is going to grow and divide too. If the mutation benefits the cell, increases the cell's ability to grow, then the cell's going to outgrow the cells around it, um, possibly even to their harm. Now, let's translate that into effects on the organism. If the mutation is harmful to the cell, it probably won't have any effects on the organism. And that's because the death of a single cell in, an or in a multicellular organism is usually an extremely trivial event. Um, the neighboring cells will step in, they'll take the place of that cell, take over its responsibilities. We see this even very, very early in um, development when it's possible to remove single cells um, clinically. It's possible to remove single cells from a very early stage embryo for genetic diagnosis, and the rest of the cells in the embryo take over the role of the missing cell as well, so that the embryo develops into a perfectly normal baby. Um, of course, the same is true for mutations that are 
phenotypically neutral. There is usually no consequences for the organism. But if the, mut cell, mut if the mutation benefits the cell, enables it maybe to grow when it shouldn't and to grow into a clump of cells, all of whom have inherited its rapid growth properties, we often view these cells as being precancerous cells. And of course, if the mutation is very beneficial to the cell, allows it to undergo rampant growth, then from an organismal perspective, we describe this as a cancer. Now, the rates of these different kinds of mutations are very hard to predict because different kinds of mutations occur at different rates and different tissues have different mutation rates as well. So point mutations occur especially frequently in cells that are dividing. Duplications and deletions, the chromosomal mutations, are generally relatively uncommon, but they have very important consequences when they happen. Mobile elements can be quite common and responsible for a substantial fraction of the mutations in a population. In different tissues, um, both chromosomal changes and point mutations occur a lot in early embryogenesis because cells are dividing rapidly um, and the cell division often makes the kind of mistakes that we'll talk about in module 10. Um, tissues whose cells no longer divide often have accumulated large numbers of mutations due to DNA damage that was poorly repaired. And tissues whose cells divide many times, for instance, our skin cells, epithelial cells, the cells that generate, the stem cells that generate the cells in our bloodstream, and our immune system, these all often accumulate very high numbers of point mutations because they've divided so many times, just the same as we said in the last lecture about sperm cells. Now, I'm going to end with a couple of examples of somatic mutations that you might have seen around you but not recognize them for what they are. So on the left, we have a some branches of a magnolia tree in bloom. And you can see most of the flowers in the background, they're all purple. But in the foreground is a branch of cells, all of whose flowers are white. And these will all be descendants of a primordial cell lower down in the growth of the tree where there was a mutation preventing the synthesis of the purple pigment. Another example is seen here in this leafy plant. Um, the, this is all one plant, and the standard phenotype is to have leaves with green centers and yellow boundaries. But here's a branch of the plant where the leaves are all completely yellow, no green at all. And here's another branch of the same plant where the leaves are all green. And now here's my favorite. This is a tulip, a red tulip. But one sector of one petal, so this is the whole petal, one sector of the petal has yellow pigment instead of red pigment. And that will be because an ancestral cell, early in the development of the flower, underwent a mutation that blocked the pathway that converts the yellow pigment to red. We'll talk more about pathways producing pigment in module three. And that's why this whole sector of the petal is yellow. So we've talked about how our perspective on mutations is very different when we're thinking about somatic cells. That mutations that can be quite harmful to the cell don't harm the organism. And mutations that actually benefit the cell can be very harmful for the organism because they allow the cell to behave as a cancer cell. Now, coming up next, we're going to talk about mutagens, about events and chemicals that increase the probability that mutations will happen. We'll think of these both in the context of somatic cells and in the context of germline cells. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about what of these mutagens should we be worrying about and what don't we need to worry about. I hope to see you there.